This segment is brought to you by 123 Digital Limited, your online and offline strategist. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? <coughs> Pretty good. Hi. Morning. Great. Hi. Hi. For all our attendees, thank you for joining our second annual Evolve themed Adapting to the New Normal. A little different from last year, this year's event is in a form of <laughs> a webinar. However, I think we will be able to meet our objective. We are currently exper experiencing unprecedented times and facing new challenges due to the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. The economy has been greatly affected by this, and we've seen job loss, salary cuts, and some business closures over the past two months. New policies have been implemented to prevent the spread of the virus, which includes social distancing, curfews, lockdowns, traffic restrictions, etc. Because of this, business have seen a reduction in foot traffic to the establishment, hence resulting in a loss of revenue. With that said, I would like to introduce our panelists as we discuss the impact of this pandemic on their business and how they've adapted to this, this new normal. In no particular order, we have Jamile Daniel, Managing Director of the Cell, Charissa Samuels, Founder of Risi Couture, House of fashion, um, Caribbean Fashion, Dahlia God, who is an entrepreneur and co-founder of Euphoria, Lance Arnold, who is the director of Joseph and Carnival Band, and who's joining us later would be Dexter Purcell, Senior Sales and Marketing Manager of Peter and Company Distribution Limited. So panelists, welcome. Thank so, you. Thanks, so, welcome. Uh, for the attendees, the way we're gonna do this is just a, a question and answer format where you will have a chance to ask questions at the end of each segment. Uh, you can either raise your hand where we would allow you to join in, or you could write your question in our Q&A um, box on your screen, right? So here we go. It's been about two months now, and the nation has been in a state of emergency. Regular working hours have been reduced and only essential businesses have been given the approval to operate. However, despite these restrictions, we have to move on. What proactive steps have you and your team taken in order to be sustainable? So Jamal, we could go with you. Uh, okay, well, as you rightfully said, you know, it's, it's really an unprecedented time for us in, in St. Lucia and the entire world. Um, and the information about the virus was, you know, it was very fluid, it was evolving every day, really. Um, so the first thing we, we did at the cell was really move to protect our staff. Uh, we had a lot of support and guidance from Digicel and the Ministry of Health, we thought, did a pretty good job in terms of outlining the protocols. Um, so we initially met with, I personally actually met with every single team member in St. Lucia um, to explain to them what we were facing, you know, as much information as we had at the time, we relayed to the staff um, to be a source of, of factual information for them. Um, to take the opportunity to, to alleviate, or to alleviate their, any fears that they had. Um, and to also, you know, we, we tend to hire young. So one of the things that we do on a regular basis is try to, you know, be a sort of, of, of you know, career um, counselor to our team and we're guiding them in terms of you know, giving them financial advice. Um, so we're explaining this thing, this is, this is evolving, you know, we, we, we're gonna see, we're going to see some hard times. So we're telling them, you know, need to, what they need to do to protect themselves. What we will be doing as a as a company, um, advice in terms of you know protecting their their or minimizing their spend going forward. Um, you know, so we we did that. We spoke to them in that regard. We ensured that we we got at the time. You know, we bought gloves. Um, the first things that we bought, and we found out okay, gloves may not necessarily be the best the best solution. Um, so we added all of the, the PPP, PPE equipment that we needed, um, as well as putting the, 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 the necessary um, social distancing and just safety procedures. Um, I mean, after that, we moved very quickly to protect our cash flow. 
uh, you know, cash is king. And even in, in times of a crisis, it is even more relevant, you know. It, so we took a very surgical approach um, and went through our p &L and really just eliminated all non-essential costs. Um, you know, marketing was reduced um, to strictly social media for now. Um, we looked at every single thing that we did not need that was on our p &L to operate and we, we, we totally eliminated that. We were really preparing for the worst, um, hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst. Um, unfortunately, we had to, to do a few layoffs. Um, we ensured that our high performers were kept in store to deal with, to, to, to deal with um, our customers. Um, it was important for us as well to stay connected to our customer base. Um, and we use mainly social media as, as, as a main avenue, um, not only to, to, to let them know what was happening, but also to guide them from our point of view by letting them know that you know, there are certain products and services that we provide that can help them through this time. Um, so certain entertainment products, gaming, um, streaming devices, um, you know, these sorts of products, uh, tablets that would enable them to, to work from home. Um, so <clears throat> at the same time, it would ensure as well um, that we had some sort of revenue coming in into to, to the company. Um, I think we were also very observant in terms of looking at opportunities that may, that may arise. Um, we've had, uh, in, we were, we were, our store was totally destroyed in, by Hurricane Ivan in Bermuda. Um, and it was, a, it was our first experience dealing with something of that magnitude. And we were surprised to notice the, the number of opportunities that came up as, as after Ivan. So we've been we're keeping our eyes on opportunities and we've been talking to our staff to look for opportunities to listen to customers when they come in. What are they asking for? What are they, what are they looking for? What can we do to, 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 to be different? Uh, what can we do to stay afloat? Um, so that was the, 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 the posture that we, we had um, as we tried to be proactive and dealing with it. Sorry. <laughs> Rissi, um, I'm going to address you that same question. I know that you have your boutique, right? And mm -hmm. um, fashion is your thing, right? Yeah. Um, for everybody um, who, who doesn't know, Rissi was is a returning panelist. And we have her today um, because, again, she's a very small business um, in, in that retail industry. And um, she has been evolving as time goes by, especially during this pandemic. So we would like to know, right, what are the proactive measures that you took in order for you to move on? All right. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, as Rankin said, um, I'm returning. Last year, I um, spoke about the demise of my business, having struggled um, trying to manage finances and the growing numbers of customers and so forth. Um, it was a very tough time for me last year. And I, after coming from Evolve, sat down, get, I got back to the drawing board, trying to figure out um, how I can reinvent myself come 2020. So this year, it, it should have been, or I shouldn't even say should have been, but this year, um, the plan was to reinvent um, or recreate Risi Couture. Um, well, we moved from Risa's Eclectic to Couture to Risi Couture House of Caribbean Fashion. Um, February 1st, we reopened our doors to customers. And, you know, I was really excited to get things up and running again, you know, um, new ideas, um, new clients on board, because this, this time around we were reintroduce, or introducing designers throughout the Caribbean. Um, so everything started off with a bang. And then of course, a few months or a few weeks ago, we hear about COVID-19. And I honestly thought that this would have been one of those um, things where it came, um, it got everybody scared and then it just disappeared. I give it a week 
<laughs> but to my surprise, we went from a week into two weeks, three weeks, you know. Um, so nothing prepared me for that. Um, my business is the way it's operated. It's, it's retail. So, of course, we have a store. People come in. Um, and it's an interpersonal kind of relationship. I was never tech savvy. So the COVID-19 really forced me to um, get up to the times. Um, but I adjusted quickly. Um, what was necessary at this point was providing masks for um, our customers. Um, and I quickly, you know, went into um, survival mode and started, you know, pulling resources from everywhere, fabric scraps. Um, and then it was now a, a, a case of figuring out, okay, how do I get these items, these masks to the people? Because we were um, then quarantined for 24 hours. Um, I, I don't know if I should say this publicly, but I disobeyed the quarantine in an effort to <laughs> ensure that everybody had masks. So it went from me, you know, just not just making them, but loading up the vehicle, driving to these different locations. I never knew of Google Maps and, and finding locations through Google. I thought this is only something we can do in the US. So when a customer said to me, oh, I'll send you my pin location. And I'm like, okay, what am I supposed to do with that? It's like, if you have internet, you'll be able to follow and you'll find me. So um, I then now started to... Um, to make those necessary adjustments. Um, customers in the past would usually send money to me via Western Union or MoneyGram. And of course, now I can't make those runs because again, we're quarantined. So I was forced to um, create a PayPal account and sit and try to understand the navigation of, of the, the app and so on so that I can be better <laughs> able to serve my customers. Um, but it's... I have to say it's a change that I welcome because, um, I mean, everything is changing. And as we hear, as we know, um, change is constant. So I just wanted to make sure that I do what is necessary to keep the customers engaged. Um, and of course, now social media is um, everything to me. That's how I get everything done. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm making it happen. <laughs> by some miracle. Right. That's good to hear. That's very good yeah. to hear using technology, right? Yeah. Even that transition from your your retail um mm -hmm. selling your fashionable items, you know, yes. etc. Um to um create mass now from those same uh -huh. that has been that has been very um good, I must say. Yeah. Yeah. So next on my list is Dahlia. Right, yeah, Dahlia in the tree is slightly different, right? Because it's basically entertainment, right? And you wear many hats, right? You are a promoter, you are a international, an international soccer artist manager, and you're also an events consultant, right? So the question was, what are the proactive steps you and your team have taken to be, to, in order to be sustainable? However, right, in the light of social distancing, Right? Has, there be, has there been any measures considered for mass crowd gatherings in the near future? You know, so for me, the reason why I tie that in is because um, that's something very proactive. And Lance, that can be addressed to you as well. But first, um, we'd like to hear your view on that, Dalia. Um, oh, good morning, everybody. Um, for me, Rankin, I almost saw my entire career the event industry become obsolete in a few weeks, in a few days, honestly. It was one minute we were preparing for euphoria and a carnival band, et cetera. And then the, the other minute it was, you know, COVID and everything got postponed. If, it's, if it wasn't postponed, it got canceled. And so euphoria fell automatically in, into that. Um, then you mentioned about artist <coughs> management and Tedison. Yes, I, ma I managed Tedison as well. So you also came from Tedison having quite a few bookings, Teddy and the band having quite a few bookings to 
I mean, this year was going to be a good year for Teddy and the band. And in a matter of weeks and days, that went out the door as well. Um, for the event industry, for me, um, from, from being an events consultant, it's a little different because um, the main problem, or at least the issue that we're facing is face-to-face -face and social distancing. Events on the whole are about face-to-face -face human interaction and, and all of that. So there, there's, a, there's a bigger problem for us. Um, in terms of putting things in, in, in a timeline, I honestly don't think to be proactive right now would be to understand what's going on in the environment. I don't think for now that live events and, and concerts, et cetera, could, could, be, could happen in the immediate few months, quite frankly. Um, a lot of if we move forward and how we proceed really relies on, you know, the Ministry of Health, the medical community and all of that. So we still have to move you know, with the guidance of, of, of some of the, those organizations. So we still have to wait. In terms of being proactive for me, at this point in time, we just need, I would just dis dissect the industry. There's short term and there's long term. There are some events that can now happen within the short term. So people who are watching who are typically doing, <coughs> excuse me, conferences, meetings, et cetera, there are a lot that there's, there, for the short term, we can use a lot of technology. I, I mean, for now, you've seen the upsurge of, of so many webinars and, you know, digital events, virtual events that can probably fit, fill in that gap for now. Um, for the long term, it would probably require us being a little more creative and probably seeing how we can do some more live events. There are now hybrid events going on now with a, with a combination of virtual and live. So, you know, that's another option that we can look into temporarily until the environment is such that we can move around and have events. Um, making our situation with this, even if we were to say that we, we, we were ready to move forward, you still have to deal with issues of, you know, economics. Can, still, can, still, can people still afford to do things that they used to do before? Like I said, you have the medical fraternity, the community that, that you're depending on. Um, would people also be very comfortable? After how long would people feel comfortable to come out again? So you have that to, to, to look into as well. Events typically encourage travel as well. So we need to take into consideration that we are working in conjunction with other industries. So you have the travel industry to bounce back, the hotel industry to bounce back. You have all those restrictions on travels, borders, etc. You need to be mindful of a vaccine not being ready at this point in time. You know, are we ready to open up? So the, the, the event industry slash entertainment is a little more complicated. I think at this point in time, um, there's a lot of monitoring that we will need to do. And I, I also think at this point in time, we can only deal with the short term for now. So using technology for event planners as well, they can also use the opportunity to, to re, what I call reskill. So you may have been an event planner, event manager, but didn't imagine when technology would have been so important to you. So now you can utilize the time to reskill, to go more into event technology, so you can design those events that, that allow you to execute remotely. Um, design, you can even start, the, you know, designing events that will give you the live components. You can also look at events in terms of, okay, how do you meet those same objectives that you would have to meet face-to-face, person-to-person in now a, a whole digital atmosphere, in a technological atmosphere happening virtually? Yes, I agree with you 100%. Right, Lance, um, can you share... Um, some light on this question. Um, similar to Sam's ranking, similar to what Daniel mentioned, I mean, inevitably, just for fun, is a social entity, um, and our our you know everything we do is about social interaction. So in a in a situation which requires social distancing, it becomes extremely challenging for us to even um, keep moving forward. So it. Again, like Dalia says, for us, 
being aware of the constantly changing environment, being able to speak to the medical professionals to understand what is allowable and things of that nature is, is critical to us um, going forward. The immediate future, I mean, we don't see, you know, obviously us being able to congregate and have you know, mass, mass gatherings and the likes. But again, how do you adjust to that? And, and I think that's, that's, always, that's always a challenge. I mean, we've, amongst our team, you know, we've looked at, and you would see as, as it is now, a lot of Instagram lives, a lot of DJs, and persons hosting events online to, pers to persons. Um, that's all well and good. The question is, how do you now monetize that? How do you now create the, 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 the enthusiasm from a social standpoint for persons to interact online? Um, that is, is, is becomes the, 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 the challenge. I mean, similar to what Jamil advised when he looked at, at the cell, um, for us, you know, paying attention to what was happening in the international sphere really and truly, I think, helped save us um, because we had to be proactive. We could not allow decisions regarding the hosting of carnival, regarding the hosting of events to catch us off guard. Um, so from very early in the game, we were paying attention, we started looking at, um, you know, speaking to our creditors, looking at our insurance packages to see, you know, what are the opportunities that are available to us to help us save, you know, in terms of help us save our business to go forward. Um, unfortunately, unless you had a pandemic insurance, there was nothing that was there that, that could, you know, support you as a business entity. Um, and by the time we approached our insurances, they said, well, no insurance would take it out at this point because they were on the verge of um, declaring COVID-19 as a pandemic. Um, so obviously insurances would not, would not be there. But I guess the challenge is, again, and we, we keep, we've been speaking to the Ministry of, of Health and the various health officials in terms of, like Dalia says, okay, as, as the controls start to relax, how do we get involved? How do we now encourage persons to come out? What are the various types of events? Because now you may have an event that's more along the lines of, um, I would like to say that associated just for fun, like a tea party kind of thing where people are more spread out. But a social gathering, you know, which gives more of that, that is not allow for the, the sort of bacchanal aspect for which just for fun. Okay, cool. Dexter, welcome. Thanks, excellent. So let me read the question, right? It's been about two months now and the nation has been in a state of emergency. Regular working hours have been reduced and only essential businesses have been given the approval to operate. However, despite these restrictions, we have to move on. What proactive steps have you and your team taken in order to be sustainable. Uh, good morning, everyone. COVID-19 has really taught us human beings a number of lessons, if one may say. Um, the new reality, or the, the way of living, or the way of life that we probably may have taken for granted, because I can recall having discussions with Lance, having discussions with Daria, and yeah, yeah, we're planning, we're meeting next week, we'll do this, we'll do that. And here are we today. Life is precious and life is full of surprises. And if you're an individual and if you, you're not mindful of that, you're here today, tomorrow you're gone. Expectations and planning can be something that we really have to appreciate. Um, as, a, as, a, as a team, planning was part of scenario for what we had to do. So pre-case number one in St. Lucia, there was a number of committees from planning the various scenarios of how you would react or how we can relate to. As you understand and appreciate the industry that I'm in, and the, the collaboration and the partnership with the event planners and event things, there's a strong correlation in what we do, how we do, and when we do it. So from a team perspective, there was a lot of planning scenario going on. But again, you don't hold the cards. So COVID-19 is okay, so I'm sure announces case number one. 
Little did we know, liquor license would have been suspended. So we still have to continue doing business. As a, as a team, as a department, this means zero revenue from my standpoint, because we saw the escalations on the hotel sector with the number of layoffs and visitors returning. We saw the bars and restaurants closures there. So all these things had a number of tremendous impact on the business that we are um, in. Um, if, I if I extend the, the conversation to the industry, if you think of our other um, similar in the lights of the distillery or the, or the brewery, you'd also see that they would have also um, faced with that new reality of not being able to, to, to sell any product that is part of the revenue stream. So one day you wake up, you have a budget, you have a plan, and you, you're doing the business, you're doing your sales, and next day, um, based on your business model and business structure, your revenue stream becomes zero. And I heard Jamal did mention of the, the shaving of the, the marketing plans and all the, the non-essentials. And it's no different to what we had to do because I mean, the, the, the laws of economics and the laws of policy and governance is a very difficult one. And I, and I can also understand the difficulty that the government is going through in trying to figure out how to put a policy in place to, to protect the nation, but at the same time, think of the, the impact of that policy on the business side of the economies of the nation. So in the planning process and the proactive measures, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult one to, 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 to unmask if your business has, is not diversified. Um, luckily for us, uh, the company I work with, we are partially diversifying that we have retail segment, we have um, essential services, cold storage, that we could have put measures in place to ensure that we were able to, to supply the nation and to continue doing some form of business. But it's nowhere close to the potential that um, we would have been at. Um, the, the gradual impact on the human being and the human behavior. You can imagine that one day you just earn a salary in the end of February, and then come March you have no income. So a, a tremendous impact on your, your behavior, your lifestyle choices and what you do. So instead of thinking where I can maybe hang out or buy a drink, I'm thinking of the bare minimum essentials. But my lifestyle for the past 10 to 15 years has been every Friday I go to Brazil. So impact on that on me as the individual, as a human being is, is tremendous. And I know there's a lot of conversation happening on the, on, the, on the economy side. There's a lot of conversation on the business side. But we have not heard many conversations on the emotional aspect of the insurance, the emotional aspect yes. of the employees who, are, who have been laid off, the emotional aspect of the, 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 the business. I mean, the emotional intelligence that comes with building for a scenario like this is very tremendous. And, and even, even the withdrawal from not being able to have a cool beer or the withdrawal from not being able to have a glass of wine, I mean, yes, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the impact that that can have on, on some people. So in the context of the conversation, I think there is a, a whole skill that we need to also look at in terms of the mental health of, of the impact on of COVID on the on the nation and its people. And also from the business end, although from the, the social aspect of it also has an impact. But in terms of, of, of being proactive, you can prepare as long as you want, but the new norm is a day or two days. Because just last week, Planning, yeah. we, were, we were close to being clear. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. cases got announced. <laughs> Sunday, another one is announced. Mm -hmm. And then coming out of these announcements will be a continuation of measures. More restrictions. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Or more measures will be implemented or extended. In that, and that is put in at the stress because the anxiety level can go that, okay, here we will. <laughs> clear. And we are going to a, a level of, okay, maybe we might get back to the new norm and then bam. So I think as, as leaders or as people in, in, in um, a senior position or as, as entrepreneurs, I think the people we are around, they, they, we really need to be open and honest. And I think there is, no, nobody knows in a whole, nobody knows. So if you can share and show empathy and, and, and be open, that we don't know what tomorrow holds, but however, collectively, if we all work together, we can come up with solutions that will see us through this pandemic. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have a few questions, right? Um, Dexter, you touched on um, an 
answer to one of the questions, right? That's from Lindell James, Oak Trees. Mm -hmm. said, and that goes out to um, Jamal, you as well. To those who actually have staff, do you have any concerns about the mental health of staff during and after the pandemic? How do you expect this to manifest? And are you expecting to put in measures to deal with that? Yeah, it's, 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 it's funny that question um, comes up because that was, that, that's an area I always, I always make mention because I find the conversation is always skewed towards the reality, but nobody speaks about the, 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 the mental aspect. And I mean, you can understand as a, as a man, um, being a <coughs> breadwinner in your family, and then you, you're being laid off. And that, and that, it's not that you cannot make it through another week or another month. Just the psychological impact of thinking that you know what happened. I as a man, as a man, I even wear my bed from tomorrow. How do I relate to that to my family, to my wife, to my girlfriend? Mm -hmm. You know, so that can have. I mean, I mean, therapy um, is an area that you, you can you can definitely look at. And I'm speaking from no perspective of a of a professional in the field. Um, I know a lot of um, people do a lot of. Um, have the pets that can help. Um, as team leaders and as, as, as managers, we, we ourselves must always be at a touching point. So for me, what I do with my team, is we do a lot of um, calling. I call them on a daily basis. Um, how are you doing? Who's doing homeschooling with the kids? Um, whether we have some Zoom call or WhatsApp call, whether we have virtual drinks. So there are different things that can happen that will contribute towards, I mean, making the norm somewhat acceptable or at least together as a team together as human beings we can we can make each other feel good, make each other feel better in a given situation uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, i think on our part we started with um you know just very open conversation and communication uh so i met with every single individual spoke with every store um, and also, we were lucky to have an HR specialist from, uh, from Digicel actually speak to every team member. Um, but that was really early on um, in the, I guess, in the evolution of the, of the virus here in St. Lucia. Um, similar to Dexter, I literally call my staff every day and ask, how are you doing? Um, you know, and it, it's not how is the business doing, how are sales, but first I ask, how, how are you doing? Um, and then, you know, I go through, you know, how do you feel? Do you feel, do you, do you feel frightened um, to, to be in the store? You know, what is trying to get an idea of where, where they, they had space is at? Um, <clears throat> in terms of the, and I think, I think that helps. I think it's gotten to a point where they're tired of me calling asking them you know, how, are they, how are they doing. But it's, it's, it's a very important question because as Dexter actually said, um, there's so much, the level of uncertainty and fear is, is, is really at an all time high now. Um, but I think as leaders as well, we need to be the voice of calm um, to, to, to our team. And you know, I make it a point of being um, the voice of, of facts because there's a lot of misinformation going out. Um, so I try to ensure that as a company, we, we provide facts to our team members. Um, I know that we will continue to get the support um, in terms of the counseling side of things from, from Digicel. Um, and I mean, and to, to people going into business and to entrepreneurs, it's really, you know, the value of strategic partnerships has really, I mean, it's been proven to me before, but in this trying time, you know, my partnerships with Digicel, my partnerships with Samsung, Samsung, Samsung officials, message me or call me every single day, touching base. How are things going? What can we do to help? Um, so, you know, these, these relationships are even more important during this time. And we can, we can share from their global experience um, and pass on that knowledge um, to our, our team members as well. Okay, great. Um, Dalian Lance, we have a question from Dion Ben, right? Can the events and entertainment industry professionals put together a protocol on what mass, um, mass crowd events and events could look like? In reality, having the Ministry of Health and Government design what the reopening of the economy will look like for the events and entertainment. And are any of you guys part of a panelist 
um, for the reopening committee. So that's for Dahlia or even Lance, if you can answer that. Um, okay, so, so I'll go. Um, as it pertains to, to, to the protocols for the mass crowd events, um, in terms of being proactive, um, event managers, you can start designing. We all know the protocols. We all know it's social distancing. We, we don't want face-to-face -face and all of that. So from an event planner perspective, you can almost look at your event and look at the areas in which um, you would need to, to, to introduce some of those. That's just one aspect of things. So even venues as well can start looking at how you lay out, how you sit, how you do certain things at venues, keeping all the protocols in mind. That's one aspect. However, the ministry itself, if, if you have event planners on board, you know when you, you know when you're setting up an event ranking, so you need to go through all of your permits. Same thing, you need to go to the Ministry of Health. The CMO still has to approve quite a bit of your things. So the ministry, by way of the CMO's office, whoever's office needs also to come up with, in, 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 in light of all of those, the health concerns and the safety of patrons and all of that, that's a bigger issue. So they now need to lay out some protocols in terms of to event planners, managers. If you're having an event of X size, whatever, these are the protocols that you need to follow. They currently have protocols in place, but it doesn't address COVID. It doesn't address social distances. Similarly, they may need to come up with some protocols that event managers, planners, promoters may must have you know, if you're going to be having mass events. So it has to be, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, something done by both parties. Both parties need to come up with what mass crowd events post-COVID would, would, what you'd need to comply with. Okay, great. Um, Lance? Yeah, I think it's, it's important. Um, as Lindell, uh, well, not Lindell, but the, the, person, the person asked, we're not part of, of any committee at this moment. Um, and I think, from, to be quite honest, I don't think East Benz is high on the agenda of the mm -hmm. government. The real, you know, exactly. um, but nonetheless, similar to what Daniel has mentioned, I think it's important that we as practitioners of persons in the industry, we need to be in touch with the medical persons and we need to sort of help advise them as to what can work for us, taking into, con to, into consideration what their protocol and requirements are. Um, so, for instance, Dalia mentioned um, venues. We know that venues are, there are specific venues in St. Lucia, but given the social distancing protocol, similar to what is happening now in business places, where it's only X number of customers per square footage of, right. of, of properties, you know, some of these things are, are things that we may now start to look at seriously. What I would suggest is that I think we need to be proactive and get together as an entity and create some of those proposals and bring to the, 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 the ministry and, and the persons um, who would inevitably give us permission. Because outside of that, I think we would be waiting forever and a day for them to look back in our direction. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, and one last question on this topic, right? Um, again, it's focused on entertainment. Um, it's true, entity, and that's from James Ajuda. It's true entertainment at the moment is now on Zoom on IG and Facebook Lives, but how do you begin to monetize such to pay artists and to keep your business alive? Right, this is a good one. And even like for me, like this is a really good question because me wanting to conduct a lot of webinars moving forward is like, okay, so how do I monetize this? You know, um, mm -hmm. are people ready to, um, pay for these online services. So, Dahlia, you could start. Can I, can I jump in? Um, so oh, okay, well, let Dexter go it, first. Yeah, I just want to jump in, just so I can make a point on the on the previous question and the committees. I think um, even through our various ministries, there is a need for uh, some form of synergy within the departments that work together. If you think of the the entertainment between the police, the, the uh, permits and everything so that when a form goes in you don't have to leave there go to another department go to another i mean if dahlia is putting a form for an application for euphoria it should go through the process either that it be online or that it be at the same location 
so there is some form of continuity and that each compartment of each ministry or department or event plan is, is, is speaking to each other. On the point of, of what Lance made also, I'm thinking that it's a perfect time because sometimes within our chip um, comes innovation. I think it's a time for a complete restructuring of what St. Lucia events or what events means and look like in St. Lucia. And 20 is like a, 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 a heartbreak warning in a sense that everybody was geared for double digit success or maximum success um, for 2020 where event management is concerned. Even me, I was already projecting my sales forecast just from here in New Fear, we'll have 10,000 people. So <laughs> <laughs> all made <of> projections, <laughs> all made of projections is on the assumptions of, of what the, the year looks like. And then here we are. So I'm saying that to say that maybe the time now is for us to really re-strategize and maybe form the, our own audience to have an audience with the, with the government and the, and the responsible ministries. So in other words, don't wait for them to come to us, come together and let's go to them and share. Because many a times when a, as a minister or ministry speaks, they don't really always understand the, all the intricacies that goes into the event planning and the management of events and, and the event and all that goes with it. All right, thanks. The question, if I may jump in and just drop one point, I think um, in, in the short term, um, and it, it can extend to the long term, um, the online, be the webinar, be the live, is, is the way to go or is the place to be. So brands, um, personalities, uh, needs to ensure that they are not left out or not forgotten in this new era of entertainment. So in other words, you need to be at the touch point if that's where the, 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 the entertainment or the reach is for your brand or for your, for your, for your image. I agree. Okay, so you remember the question asked before, guys, or you want me to repeat? I, All right. I, I, think, I think I remember. I it's think just, I remember. It's, it's from James. He's just talking about how do we monetize all these um, IG lives, Facebook lives, you know, Zoom webinars, you know? Um, and again, in order for us to keep our business alive, in order for us to pay our artists, because right now we've seen a lot on those Facebook lives, artists doing a lot of concerts. I remember um, TJ had one with Shemi um, a couple of weeks ago. You know, you have the DJs doing it, um, HP, Levi, etc. right? But um, again, it's more than just entertainment. This will become the new normal, right? So how do we um, monetize these things? I, I, I honestly feel in the same way that us within our industry, we need to look around to see what's happening. I also think technology and digital platforms, et cetera, will also look around and see what's happening and realize that there is a need for, for, for artists, et cetera, to be able to monetize. I think last week, if, if I'm, I mean, I could be corrected, but I think last week I read something from Facebook oh, saying that yeah, um, yeah. it would develop a, a platform that would allow artists to actually be able to charge when they have their events live on Facebook. That was mm -hmm. in the making. Okay. I read that, I swear, I read, yeah. I read that article last week. So it's coming, it is there. I mean, the same way we're looking at what's going on around us, um, other industries are. So I think sooner rather than later, um, the various platforms as it relates to IG, et cetera, may look, we just need to pay attention to what's going on. They may be able to create, you know, avenues in which um, these things can be monetized. Like I said, I know Facebook released something. And I also feel to some extent, I don't know how many people um, took part in the, Teddy Riley versus Babyface um, showdown on IG that had mm -hmm. almost 4 million um, viewers and all of that. So you couldn't log on, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. So hopefully these are indications or these are signs to IG and the various platforms that perhaps that might be some of the things that they would need to incorporate within to the platform. Okay. Just in quickly in terms yeah. of the in entertainment. Um, there was a particular DJ in the, one of my favorite DJs, um, gosh, Rico Suave. Um, he had a few IG lives streaming, um, I guess, and um, he was taking donations. Yeah. Um, 
people, I think, I don't even know if you, he actually started asking for donations, but people were giving donations. Yeah. It was small amounts, it was a dollar, a dollar, five dollars. I mean, you know, I thought it was a great idea because he was providing a service to people, you know, he was entertaining people. Um, and I think through a number of gigs, he was able to raise a few thousand dollars yeah. um, and people were transferring money to his cash app. So, you know, maybe our, our artists here can use, you know, if not cash app, maybe PayPal, maybe some means. Um, give it a try and see, you know, and see what, what, how much traction and what the feedback is. Yeah, I've, I've seen um, those DJs put up their cash app um, usernames right. and in PayPal, you know, in order um, to monetize their platform. Right? But well, let, let, let me say, Rankin, so, yeah. so for now, it, it is, there's, nothing, there's nothing structured in terms of, of the payment like you would have had for, yeah. for, for an event. So I'm thinking later on in terms of Facebook and some of, of those platforms, that will be introduced, however, in agreement to Jeremiah, I've attended quite a few, during COVID, I think I've, I, I learned quite a few places. I saw Blacks did one on WAC Radio, I attended. Um, right. Then you had, to give, you had to give a donation, it was up close and personal with, with Blacks, with Iowa George, with quite okay. a few of them that WAC Radio was doing. And all you had to do was to go to some GoFundMe account and make a donation. So, but these things are not, it's not structured. After a while, you would need to get it structured. And I'm hoping by that time, like I said, Facebook, IG, and some of those other avenues would have had a proper structured way that you could view live and be able to actually pay. Okay, no problem. All right, so we're going to move on. Very good discussion. Um, for all those who've been asking questions, I will address your questions as we go along. But we have our format, which we have to follow. All right. So next question, consumers have now been adjusting to this new protocol. There are, they are unable to conduct business as usual. However, expect the same or even greater level of customer service. How does your establishment ensure that your team understands and also able to deliver exceptional customer service? Um, Dexter, I will start with you. Um, and the reason why, as you said, you guys were able to quickly more or less diversify, um, providing support in the essential arena. Um, also, um, we all know that the liquor, we have a, a short term liquor ban right now, but a P10 company distribution was able to, from the onset, provide the, I think, curbside pickup, right? All right, and yeah. um, this is more or less that given that customer that experience you know as soon as the, the lockdown was or the restrictions were um assist um people were able to start purchasing the product so i'd like to know further how your establishment ensure that your team understands the customer service and pres and, and 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 presents um the, the extraordinary customer service to the to to your customers. Yeah, um, it's 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 a good question, and, and it's, it's it's all part of, of thinking out of the box because if with with the number of limitations that exist um, as a result of COVID, it it kind of forces you to figure to be in a consumer's perspective to see how I would like to be served and how about searching for service. Um, Social distancing, for example. So you had to go through the demarcation of all the in the stores from the outside. You have to put up the, the barriers and the, and the social distancing six feet apart um, dimensions. So, and in the early stages, there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of panic, a lot of rush. So when we were on the 24 hours of shutdown thereafter, we all saw the long lines. Um, to mass mega to all the various stores and um, part of what we had to do is to figure out how do we ensure that every household got service so we had to ensure that we let the ministry understand and it's not just um, from the retail but the vans on the road how do we ensure that the milk the butter and the and the the canned food reaches to Shuzel? how do we serve the people in in, in ancillary and canneries because the initial point <coughs> where um, they were allowing service to go island wide. 
And again, it is the sharing of the information that everybody understands the intricacies of what we do and how you do it. So providing the service to, to the various communities and ensuring that the curbside was implemented was part of the, 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 the thinking out of the box we had to, we had to do. Um, moving forward, if you think of St. Lucia as a, as a, as a market, um, we do now a lot of online shopping. And when I speak to online shopping, I speak, you can see the number of um, shop box, um, Amazon accounts every week we, we shop online. I mean, a fancy outfit will come out this week on, on Zara's website and it's in St. Lucia in a party next week because you shop online. But when you flip it and you think of for our essential services for grocery shopping or for anything in St. Lucia, what's the percentage of persons who shop? Online, or what's the person of, or what business setup has an online setup that will enable me to stay at home and my groceries get to me? Mm -hmm. Say less than one percent. So again, is it e-commerce? Is it is it the delivery? Um, I've I've seen a number of um, small business opportunities sprung up with people now doing your shopping for you. You send it, you send your order in, and they do it for you, and it's delivered at home. So as a company. We have to do it ourselves, or we partner and be an enabler to a small business like that to enable that the product get out and the way of doing business or the retail experience is changed. Um, you said you went to 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 all those live party, but I can almost guarantee you, you didn't get your favorite drink at that party because I didn't find a way to get the drinks delivered to your house. Right. So, so the conversation now and the accepting of the new norm. <coughs> How do we now find a, a, a roadmap that will enable us um, to, to, to live as comfortable as we, we, we possibly can and adhere to the restrictions and not, not go out of our mind? I mean, the, the, the lifestyle will change because the disposable income is now not very disposable. Um, people will have to make lifestyle changes um, in terms of the choices. So, where would I buy? Maybe my, my frozen baguette. Um, now I will have to buy the flour so I can do the bread at home. Mm -hmm. So now use that extra $2 of the convenience of a baguette to buy my something else. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in offering that service, and again, from, from, the, from the staff perspective, I mean, you can understand and appreciate the whole panic of the unknown and, and all the fear that comes with it. And you still have to be there serving the customers and trying to adhere to the protocol. So again, it, it, it had multiple dimensions of the out-of-the-box thinking, but I think moving forward, we will still be seeing some new changes coming to the way we access goods and where we, we, we shop. All right, great. Risi. Hi. Your turn. I almost fell asleep, huh? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you come in. You Lance, come. Lance, you okay? I hear you coughing there. I, I got a little scared there. I was tempted to come <laughs> off the call, eh? <laughs> Yeah, so when it comes to customer service, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think, again, from the onset, you are one of those individual small businesses who actually um, created a product, right? To meet mm -hmm. your, your customer needs, you know? Yeah. So tell me about the, um, your, how you delivered that customer service. You did mention earlier, you know, you were delivering um, during the quarantine mm -hmm. time, you know, but just... Tell us a little bit more about the way and your approach to providing mm -hmm. that great customer service. Yeah, so um, for me, it, it, um, it was a, a lot of adjusting because we're known for, you know, um, preparing or, or creating customized clothing, ready to wear clothing and so on. So to now be in a position where, you know, um, clothing is not a demand, but now masks are a demand um it, it was almost insensitive to suggest to customers buy a top buy a dress whatever the case might be um so now trying to service that need of masks only um i basically continue doing pretty much what i would do which is to create the product advertise it on on um on instagram or facebook and then have the customers reach out to order and whatnot. Um, we have very good rapport on, on WhatsApp and Instagram. 
And of course, as you mentioned, I do the deliveries because nobody wants to leave their home. Nobody feels safe to leave their home. So um, I just bring, bring the product to them, you know? Okay, great, great. Um, yeah. Is that it, Rizzi, or? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. With regard to customer service, we have, I think we've nurtured a culture of, of customer service. Um, and it's something that we've always stressed on very highly um, to the point where, I mean, everything is, the whole retail experience is audited very frequently from, you know, you walk into the store, is the, the sign clean, is the glass clean, how quickly were you greeted, were you greeted with a smile, the entire experience. So I think, you know, we have that foundation. I mean, there's, it, there's always, there will always be room for improvement. Um, I think teams have done pretty well. Um, but we have a foundation of, of customer service and I think the teams, they understand what it takes to, to deliver good customer service and to go above and beyond. Um, it's a different time now. Um, <clears throat> so the approach has been, firstly, I, I find what worked is that, you know, ensuring that the staff was safe, um, firstly, can ensure that they can deliver a, a higher level of service to, to any customers that are actually coming into the store. Um, any customers coming into the store, you obviously have to ensure that they are safe. But <clears throat> as a result of COVID, obviously, we don't have the level of foot traffic coming into the stores that we have before. Um, so even pre-COVID, one of our main objectives and strategies for this year was to, to really add convenience, customer convenience. And that, and COVID has really accelerated that for us. And that is really, you know, what we've spoken about before in terms of a customer should be able to go on our website um, and order an item as easily as, as all of us go on Amazon and order an item and have it delivered to their door. Um, I think there's added value in knowing that uh, the customer or for the customer that you're purchasing from a local, com a local company, um, money circulating in the, in the local economy. Um, but these are the things that we cannot have an approach anymore where we expect customers to come to us. Um, we have to go out to customers and we have to do everything that we can to make it as convenient as possible with the use of technology, um, partnering for us. It's, 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 I think it's more cost effective if we partner with the delivery provider and to actually take on the, the responsibility of, of, of ourselves. For ourselves, I think we need to, to beef up our, um, our tech support. The products that we sell are obviously tech products. Some of the people, some of our customers may not be as tech savvy as, as, as us. They look, they look to us as being um, the tech experts. So how do we ensure that the same level of the same customer experience that we're delivering in store, we can now translate that um, to the customer and it's all in my mind it, it's all e-commerce um, and it's all really understanding their needs and being able to, to meet the customer um, where it's most convenient for them um, pre-covid biggest competitor has always been amazon um, amazon is really the retail killer yeah. how do you minimize or cushion the impact of amazon in the local economy as businesses, we need to, to understand the strengths of Amazon and we need to, the convenience has to be a major factor in your strategy. Um, and if, you, if you're in any doubt how powerful, um, who the winners are in this whole thing, it is actually Amazon. I mean, the, 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 the founders' wealth went up by $24 billion during this time. So while the economies are suffering, while countries are suffering, Amazon is actually, you know, very extremely profitable. They're, they're growing at a tremendous rate. Um, so the customer service has to be um, to ad adopt the convenience model of, of Amazon. Um, Lance, you'd like to share? Um, I think for us, as just for fun, you know, a couple of years ago, we, when we looked at the industry within which we were operating, we said, how do we differentiate ourselves? And one of the, the critical ways that we can differentiate ourselves was with respect to customer service. Um, and that's within all aspects of, of our business. Um, we looked at everything from at our events. How long does a, a customer or patron take 
to to access a drink how long how do they long do they take to access the event itself how long you know does someone take even on the road and you you partying in a large band how long do you take to literally get yourself a drink um how long do we take to respond to emails and things of that nature and, you know so with that a process that was started many years of a, a few years ago i think we've seen the benefits of that now in 2020 and even more and i think it's it served us well especially now within you know with the advent of covid 19. Um, so our our base of our, of our customers we we seek to make sure that we always give them information um, we utilize um, the social media platforms extensively to make sure that persons are aware of what's going on. Because like Jamal says, I think everyone wants information. I mean, it to be factual in terms of the information that we're preparing and so that persons can best plan for that. Um, our team, I mean, from everybody that's been on our team, one of the things we've always um, promoted is that question of customer service. If you don't, if someone asks you something, you know, get back to them with a question. If you don't know, pass it on, you know, and things of that nature. And we've seen that really and truly work with, with, with us um, with the postponement of Carnival this year and how our supporters, even at this difficult time when people are losing employment and things of that nature, the level of, the level of retention that we are seeing is even surpassing what we had initially thought. And we are very grateful for that. And I think it comes back to one, the customer service that we've had and the level of confidence that people have in the entity just for fun um, going forward. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we will continue to, to, to keep it that way and make sure that we can provide that one-on-one -on -one via WhatsApp, via email and things of that nature. So it gives people that personal touch and we're not just far removed from the customer base. Okay, great. <coughs> um, Dalia? Um, from, from, I'll address it from an events planner um, perspective. I, I think it's a, it's a very difficult time now for everybody. And as it pertains to customer service, I mean, I would suggest or recommend that the approach has to be, um, we have to listen a lot more. Um, it will require a lot of empathy and compassion in how we speak. And, and, and I mean, sometimes we brush these things off, but these things are very important. Um, it's not about competence, what I have and what I can do, as opposed to really trying to help people solve some of their issues and their crisis during this 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 time that this difficult time that they're facing. So, your 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 conversation needs to change. I mean, uh, for example, you're an event planner. Somebody has a wedding. All of a sudden, it has moved from not being able to invite your 400 people to now you're down to you know 70 people your whole dream oh you know so you really need to listen you really need to be able to provide solutions and you too as an events planner you really need to be on the ball with 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 all aspects of events so you can advise and be able to help them as it pertains to solutions so it's not competence it's about how do i help you solve certain issues that would come up and that's why event planners who have clients that they're helping to navigate during this time okay great now we have a few questions all right um and even comments we have one from Adele, right? I want to add to the panelists' discussion on James's question, monetizing these webinars, lives, online services. Marketing via the web and product placement in lives gives away, give ways during these sessions. Partner, partners with providers who are unable to generate everyday sales on liquor supplies, devices, even tutorials, etc. We see an increase in cooking classes, etc. Like Dexter pointed out, it also is the best time to be creative and keep your brand in the forefront of the individual's mind. Mm -hmm. In agreement with Dahlia, whether it be a small cash app fee or $5 from all followers, this too brings in revenue. Engaging participants touches on the mental releases, keep them laughing, entertain, as mentioned earlier, providing a stress relief. Once people believe it is beneficial to them to invest $2 or $3 and join a live class where there's a chance to win a coupon, a bottle, etc. I see continuance until, of course, change 
which is inevitable. All right, so that was from Adele. Um, we also have a question. Right, another question, but next, a statement from Lindell James to actually monetize the event industry, we will need to own the digital platforms. All right, so um, what else do we have here? Um, we have a question, we have a, a question on tourism from Annie Alexander. Considering that our main industry is tourism and many businesses are codependent on the industry, on that industry, how will the extent, the extended, sorry, closure of the borders affect the viability of your business? And so, um, Risa, we could come to you with that mm -hmm. question. So I'll read it again. Considering that our main industry is tourism and many businesses are codependent on that industry, how will the extended closure of the borders affect the viability of your business? Oh. So, for example, a lot of going, a lot like for okay. example, a lot of your clients are probably um, from the hotel industry, working in restaurants, um, mm -hmm. bars, etc. And at this time, they may not be able to purchase the luxury items they used to from you. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know um, now we have the the closure of the borders, the extended closure of the borders. How does it affect the viability of your business? Well, I can tell you um, a lot has a lot of revenue has, has gone from all of this happening. Um, of course, persons are not purchasing um, clothes anymore. So um, it forces me now to think of other aspects of, of generating an income. Um, I know now that with um, a lot of medical personnel um, having to work over time and, and so on and so forth, I am now looking at um, making um, the, what you call the scrub caps and, and um, uniforms for the medical personnel. So, I mean, with not having tourists coming in, I'm now forced to look at other ways of, of generating an income so it's it's an adjustment but i am working towards doing what's necessary to keep going all right anybody would like to answer yeah. that question or with the add-on to this question yeah if i may jump in yeah on the tourism on the tourism aspect <coughs> um it's a tough one for us as a, as a country because you think of five percent of your, your gdp really depends on on tourism so this one will definitely have a tremendous on our economy. However, within the, the local industry or the local economy, we can focus more on, on local tourism. So prior to post-COVID, it, it used to be called staycations. And I used to say um, the, 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 the local tourism product will be one that might need more development to ensure that um, local participants in the various hotels and to enjoy a vacation. I know it's difficult sometimes that we, we, we live on a vacation island and that we take for granted what we have. But um, if we are able to find a manner that um, the hotels can, can ensure that a percentage of their uh, revenue or market share depends on the market, it can make us less exposed to international tourists. Um, another area, I mean, the borders is closed, but if you think our own local border is closed, you can't go south. <laughs> Who have ever thought, you know? So uh, for the bigger chains of the hotel, now if I go into directly into the hotel industry, um, the bigger chain like, it will be more of a, a destination impact. So if I think of Sanders, the chain, where they have multiple destinations, it's a matter of one brand opening up a, a, a destination. But if you think of a, a smaller boutique hotel, uh, let's say at Sugar Beach or, or Jade Mountain, where you have a hundred room or 200, and, and that we might see a quicker reopening towards that in that it is less complicated in terms of the numbers, and maybe even the layout of those, of those property can help 
expedite the, 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 the rate of reopening. If you think of, if you think of Tikai, every, every cottage is, a, is, a, is in a remote location, you know? So that in terms of social gathering rules, that, that could have taken care of that. Um, hotels will not have to be adjust because the buffet is gone. Because nobody will go down to the lobby to have breakfast buffet style. So again, the hotel industry themselves will have to, to make the various changes that will enable them to, to align themselves and to be ready for, for, for reopening or for that industry to come back to some form of normal. The, the airline industry is, is one which will also have an impact because an airplane will not fly down here half empty. So the conversation is whether we're going to have full oxygen mask <laughs> as we travel. I don't know. But I <laughs> right know with COVID and all what's going on, I can almost guarantee that there are a percentage of the, 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 the tourism um, patrons who just wants to get out <clears throat> to a vacation after going through the stress of the restriction, being stuck at home, working from home and everything. Yeah, I, I believe that. Yeah. It's, one, it's one, there's no clear cut answers, but I think every different components can be looked at and see how, you know, it can be developed to, to, to ensure that there's some form of revenue generation or some form of, 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 of cushion is the goal. Okay, great. Um, we're just going to do one more question, right? And that's from like our pre previous um, segment. Um, that's from Anna Whitfield. So what Dexter has said, event authorizing agencies will also have to change the method of service delivery to accommodate social distancing protocols. This would mean digitizing the process of event management authorization. Right, so Lance, I'm, I'm directing this question to you. How do event producers see themselves advocating for this? I, I, I don't think, well, the, the good thing about it is, this is something that we've been advocating for a little while now. Um, because, you know, as not just a carnival band, but when we host events, you know, we, we need to recreate documents and print out these loads of documents and, and deliver, hand deliver. And we've been, you know, advocating uh, everything from the health passes right through that these things can be submitted in a, in a digital manner. I think so. I, um, Dexter probably, um, possibly mentioned it earlier in the sense that out of, you know, disasters like this comes benefits. And I think this is one of the benefits that I can hope, you know, to take on board. A lot of the government agencies are being forced to do things mm -hmm. on, online, and do things via technology, rather than the old adage of, you know, buy a form, fill it out, and bring it back into the doc into the ministry. So we are hoping, I mean, we, we have been a proponent of this, and we'll continue even now more so that, you know, these things can be submitted digitally and, and you know, not have this, this interaction. All right, great. All right, so let's move on. Um, we're going on to digital right now, use of technology. We have a few technological questions um, and we will address that at the end of this segment. So the question is, we are in a digital era and we know how effective technology can be used as a tool for inventory, daily operations and communication. At the moment, how do we effectively use technology in our business and communication? So Dalia, you wanna go? You wanna? Um, as it pertains to to to, th th there's actually been um, an explosion of, of of all technologies developed as it pertains to events. Um, look at us now. We having we we having we having an event based on, on 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 technology. We're not doing face to face. We're doing technology. Um, so as it pertains to events, there's quite a bit um that that you can research that you can look at that allows you webinars you can have online you have other digital platforms that that you can use i was reading up on one called hopkins it is that allows you to do conferences online so as of now in the downtime you can actually research you actually get technologies that that you can actually use to help you do um quite a few things um let me just mention that minus live concert that's a whole new ball game um we there, there had always been a time when the events industry especially conferences and meetings industry was having this same discussion about technology there had always been the conversation about um should we 
travel for conferences because a lot of us know sometimes there are some big conferences that we want to attend. It's in Vegas, it's in all different places. We can't attend. It's costly travel, accommodation, spend the number of days out of work. So, so, so these are conversations we were having way back then. Um, so with, within that context, technology was already, had already been developed so that you could have had conferences online, um, um, meetings online and all of that. So mm -hmm. to some extent, some of these things are not new. We just need to research them and see which digital platforms that we can, you know, synchronize to get the same or at least close to the experience that we're looking for as if we were there face to face. All right, great. Um, Dexter, the use of technology. Yeah, I think, um, and I think in the, in the discussion, we, we raised the point. Um, Okay, so if you, if you look at technology, and I think Jamal made the point about um, Amazon, I think in, in, in St. Lucia as a, as a market, I think we are tech suave, so to speak. And I think kudos to Jamal and the cell on the job you're doing in educating um, the St. Lucia public on the various handsets and the various technology that exists out there, both through online and through the different platforms that you utilize. But the habit is already in us. Um, plants, mm -hmm. you, you guys, Dahlia, you too, you guys, are, um, kudos to you guys for all the e-ticketing that you do at your events. So when you look at this, you, you, you guys are coming to me to have a discussion. You come in for a layer of your site plan. So in terms of technology, I think we have done some work in, in shifting away from the paper to, to, the, to the new norm of utilizing the technology. I think... Um, Part of the biggest challenge would be to ensure that the, the market is, is, is tech savvy. So you're shopping on Amazon to get your this or that. Um, you're shopping online to get your tickets to go to the, to the event. You're shopping online to get access to your, to your, to your outfit. And if the conversation continues, that it, it becomes part of our DNA for our groceries and for our, 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 our drinks and everything else. Um, when it comes now to, to the use of it now, and, and how does a brand connect through, through use of that technology? So, the experiential marketing and experiential marketing and creating experiences is something that has just gone kaboom. And, and brands have now realized the, 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 the relevance and the reference of ensuring that you, you, you create that one on one time with your patrons, you create one on one time with your, with your consumers. And if you, if, you, if you go to, to an event, yes, you purchase a ticket online. But when you walk through that gate, I can almost guarantee that you will see lands there. You guarantee you will see Dahlia running around. And there is that touch point that we cannot put a finger on that creates a value to our patrons. And in a small society where we know everybody, we see everybody, be it the kids at school, be it in, in the shopping, it's important that we, 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 we get a way, a hold on, ensuring on the technical part that we can still connect. For me, I'm still busting my brain as to how do I get the drink to Dalia's house for that party she planned to go to on Friday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so again, technology will have to play a part in, in, in doing that. And I think as we move forward, the need will be there will be a greater need for patron and I don't want to use the word enticing, but for, for rewarding our patrons. Because as, as it becomes less interactive and less personal, we will have to be created so that we can ensure that the brand, be it the sale, be it the story, whatever the brand is, can relate and can be at a touch point with that patron. Agreed. Jamal? Um, I think, you know, when I think about technology now, and I think about it in, in, in terms of <clears throat> what we're experiencing now, I think, you know, what if we were experiencing this 20 years ago? You know, um, it would have been a nightmare for, for your kids, um, the level of entertainment and, and WhatsApp would not have been there, and, and FaceTime would not have been there. Um, productivity would have been significantly down. I mean, I know Skype was around at the time, but not. I don't think any of the collaborative tools were, were, were in use at that time. Um, <clears throat> so I'm happy that, you know, we've come a long way and we, we're experiencing this, you know, in a time where we can, we can piggyback on the technology. Um, I agree with, with Dahlia that uh, a lot of the platforms out there, 
globally. Um, mm -hmm. What happened is some of the platforms like Zoom has been spotlighted right now. Um, the, the, the relevance and the need for, for those platforms have, have just skyrocketed. Um, so if you're looking at technology, you're looking at I mean, what we're using right now, everybody's using Zoom right now. Um, <clears throat> I'm using Zoom for work, hardly for work, to be quite honest. We're still using Skype for work. But um, to chat with all of my friends all over, all everywhere, we're actually, we're actually chatting on, on, um, on Zoom. Um, when we look at the technologies that WhatsApp has created, that you know, there's, we just activated our web chat on our website. Um, we look at, at you know, Instagram, Facebook, all of these methods that <clears throat> enable us to stay in touch or connect with our customers, um, to keep our brand top of mind, um, and to also just enable our team to be more productive. Um, I haven't seen many new technologies. Um, as I said, I just think they're really being highlighted right now. Um, so, <clears throat> Um, I mean, everything that we've, we've really mentioned, it's just, I think we're maximizing the use of it right now. Okay, great. Um, Rishi, to you, um, I know your phone died earlier. Right? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no problem, but I'll just um, reiterate the, the question. We are mm -hmm. now in the digital era, and we know how effective technology can be used as a tool for inventory, daily operations, and communications. At the yeah. Moment, how do you effectively use technology in your business and communication? And you know, I've seen it with you. You have literally maximized social media, Instagram, to push your product and to let your customers um, know that you have a new product on sale. Mm -hmm. Let's talk mm -hmm. about it. Because earlier you spoke about the Google Maps, et cetera, the location. On yeah. You know? So yeah. Can you tell us how um, you manage to use technology right now in this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I can tell you I've been operating in the Stone Age <laughs> before all of this. Um, a customer asked me um, maybe about two weeks ago to send her um, an uh, email and invoice to her, you know. Now, usually I would write my invoices and I'm saying email and invoice and my daughter overheard and she's like, mommy, there's an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I quickly um, downloaded the app and I was able to um, make a, a more um, professional presentation with um, my quotes and so forth, which made me re which really made me feel good about myself, you know. Um, but I have quickly jumped onto the, the, the technological bandwagon and trying to move my business from, as I said, Stone Age to um, a more modern, um, um, a modern way of serving my customers. Um, I've not only done um, the, the invoice um, app, but I've also done the PayPal, which I, I did probably two, <laughs> two nights ago. Um, but it's been working effectively and, and I feel um, quite efficient too in the way that I serve those customers. Um, we've been using, making good use of, of Instagram, as, as you've said, and um, also WhatsApp, because I now call them via video so that they can see me. Um, I let them know that I've received payments and so forth, so it gives comfort to them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been working for me. Okay, great. Um, Who's next? Valia, you next? Yeah, I, I just want to point out ranking, like to, to some extent, just adding again to what Jomail said, I think a technology, a lot of technology exists that we can implement across our businesses, across industries. But we need to be honest. Um, I, I don't think solutions are not, not a lot of us are into the technology for some, for some mm -hmm. reason. Some of us don't like technology. Um, yeah. It's a major, quite intimidating. If, if, yeah, if, if one of the things that we're trying to get away from. So, if social distances face to face is going to be the issue, highly likely what is going to help us circumvent this is really putting a lot of our processes, etc., online. So, yeah. what COVID, what COVID has really done is it has accelerated some of the processes that we will or we should have been doing already. But we were not, it wasn't mandatory. We didn't have that push for us to get it done. 
So we were still wanting to write our things. I mean, typically, mm -hmm. submissions don't get an ATM card. They take a long line in the bank, and you uh, wonder why not yeah. just go in the ATM. <laughs> it's one person on the ATM. Put your card, run out. No, they just rather do the whole thing. So I think Guilty. out of, of, of bad <laughs> comments, good. So I think yes. COVID kind of is accelerating us in terms of technology. Last year, ranking mm -hmm. two years ago, we were mm -hmm. doing our cricket, our ICC Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. We couldn't go to Antigua everywhere. We were talking to headquarters every Monday via Zoom and a couple things. So, I mean, when I did jazz, we did side visits with, uh, with showing, you know, via phone, WhatsApp, video, where to position things when you couldn't, when, for example, BET was not there to see. So we had meetings, we had things. So we've been doing that for a while. It's just that now it's almost mandatory that if you're not in, you know, it's like almost swim or drown kind of. And so we yeah. now really need to get moving. So I think right. that's one of the good things that the positive things, the good things that's coming out of COVID. I also feel mm -hmm. that it is a good time, like I said earlier, to reskill. If technology was not a thing that you like, like me to some extent, I'm spending all of my time into technology, into everything digital. That's where my mind is right now because inevitably that is where I have to go. So I've already yeah. programmed my mind that from now until every time I get up this technology, you either you swim or you drown, basically. So it's an area that, you know, we can start, we have to start thinking of seriously and it'll be very useful to our businesses across industries. Okay, great. Just a few more comments in terms of the use of technology. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, what has happened in, in this, this lockdown is the, the work from home exper experiment, which from what you're hearing has been you know, very successful in most regards. And I think it's going to be more, even more successful when you have school resuming and kids are going back to school. So it will, it will, it will allow more quiet time for, for parents to work at home. Um, so as a business owner, I am actually, I'm walking into my office and I'm looking at the square footage and I'm saying, well, do I really need this, you know, 1,000, 2,000 square feet that I have now for office space? Yes. yes. Do I just need a room that we can come in twice a week, three times a week and discuss or collaborate on certain things? You know, it, yeah. it's, it's on my mind. Um, yeah. then, cost savings that, that there are a lot of cost savings obviously that you can get from the use of technology i'm hearing that mom had their first um, virtual heads of government meeting and i could imagine the cost savings of that would be tremendous if you have to put up the heads of government in terms of the airfare in terms of of um accommodation and all of these things um but on a on a local level on a on my business level i'm looking at i'm really looking at things on a, a square footage um you know factor and seeing well how could we save um yeah in terms of sharisa you know i'm mm -hmm. smiling when sharisa is talking about it and i appreciate your openness and your honesty um but it creates an opportunity you know people mm -hmm. are, are going to be forced to embrace you know e-commerce and, and the whole on all of your online platforms but people yeah. need support people need people need guidance so there's an opportunity created now for people to provide tech support for yeah. people and other people that, that you know may may just have a mental block towards towards you know going online but it, it you know it could mean the survival uh, of, of their business um so opportunity cost savings um so there are a lot of there, there there's a lot you know going on and there's a lot that has been created as a result of the crisis okay. yes yeah. I'm, 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 I definitely agree with you because that's one of the points I was about to make. Um, we, we speak of IT and, and, and technology, but the, the IT professionals will have to come out of a box of just being an IT professional and really understand the various industries so that they can curtail products that will be used in the various <laughs> industries. Right. So, yeah, I might be an IT professional, but if I don't understand what Jamal's business is about, or if I don't understand what my business is about, I cannot design a product. To sort it. So you will have to come out of just being a straight IT kind of personnel and think of the entire process of product consumption of, of brand utilization that will enable now system developing that program that can be utilized to make a seamless transaction for, for that for that brand or for that. Right. Okay, great. Um Lance. Let's say to add to add to all of this, uh, what I'm looking forward to is um, 
hopefully the, the movement within the financial sector in St. Lucia to, to go and offer services online. Um, because even from, from a just for fun perspective, what we've recognized is that, so for instance, in terms of processing, we, because we have a, a large um, foreign base and local base as well, um, online processing transactions, it becomes more complicated if we try to do it locally, which is even something that you know, you need to come in and swipe a card and things of that nature, as opposed to having these online processes that are available. I mean, we've been working with, with some of our banks and, and, and moving along on those lines. And I saw a question that one of our um, viewers raised. And I think it, it is important because, you know, it's restrictive in a sense in that unless you have, you know, a PayPal account and things of that nature, which are all outside of St. Lucia, it becomes challenging for locals to do this from their desk. They need, still need some sort of interaction to access cash as opposed to people being able to pay directly in. I mean, now the banks are moving to EFT and things like that. Which is great, and I mean, we embrace that. But I think, it, I think coming out of COVID, we will see an acceleration of that within the local um, financial sector. Okay, okay, great. So guys, I'm hoping yeah. as well, sorry, I'm just hoping as well with, with that acceleration that the, the, the fees that the banks are charging are also All right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's prohibitive for us to operate online. Okay, cool. Um, that has cool. been a, a, a main fact, a critical factor, actually. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so we have 15 minutes, right? So I'm just going to go through a few questions and comments, right? Um, we have one from Roran Adams. Right, good morning all. This challenge posed of uh, this challenge posed by COVID-19 is multidimensional and require a varied a varied approach to the various uncertainties deriving there therefrom. What do you see as the top five business opportunities deriving from this challenge? So let me repeat that again. This challenge posed by COVID-19 is multidimensional and required, require a varied approach to the various uncertainties deriving therefrom. What do, what do you see as the top five business opportunities deriving from this challenge? So everybody just mentioned one, like a top business that you think. Um, I, I have one, I, I think technology is one. Um, so if you're thinking anything in terms of opportunities, technology for sure, learn everything technological, you should be making some money somewhere in COVID. Um, mm -hmm. I think the health sector is another place that you can look at. It mightn't be doctors or lawyers, um, doctors, sorry, and nurses immediately, but products associated with hygiene. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Dexter is there. Dexter, some time ago when I was at Peter and Company, it was one of them, H1 or one of them. And, and let me tell you, in within that DKS portfolio, we had to import so much hand. I had never imported hand sanitizer like that in my life. And today, hand sanitizer was like an item you won't even find on the shelf. And within yeah. that instant, we had to almost be doubling and tripling. So the health sector is something that you can look at in terms of materials, disinfectants, um, um, your gloves and all of that. I also think the cleaning sector is another area that you can look at, like um, your Lewis Industries, et cetera. Companies along that path um, could be something that you can look at as well because it will entail now a lot of cleaning. So you need the airport sanitized, your hotels, your public transportation, a lot of things are going to have to be clean for us to be confident and comfortable to come up. So th that's at least three, three sectors for me that, that I feel at this point in time should kind of wave a flag as to where you can probably go in. Um, marketing to some extent, pre-COVID, post-COVID, you always need to communicate with your customers. You always need to tell your, you now need to tell your customers what happened then to what's happening now. Um, how you speak to your customers is going to change your value proposition, all of that. So you need all of that in terms of, of, of marketing to have all your messaging pretty much in, in on point to, you know, to, to get your customers because you have to bounce back. So you have to get your customers back excited. So I would still say that marketing to some extent is there to stay. 
Um, you would also mm -hmm. need your assistance with your digital and your social, all your digital mm -hmm. marketing, your Pinterest, your social, um, your Instagram, your Facebook and all of that. So all of those cheaper ways as well to get your message across. If you're cutting budgets and cutting all of that, you would need professionals within digital marketing fields as well to make your spend go further than, than you currently have. So that's what four. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think these are my top four. Okay, but you only had to answer one, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, I, sorry. <laughs> yeah. She answered uh, for us. Yeah. So that's four, so one more. Teamwork, well. teamwork. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah. Uh, boy, is it my turn? Yeah, uh, just, just anybody, like, just yeah, one. There's one, one, one business one. that you think that could be right from this. Quickly, I, I jokingly say that I, wish, that I wish I had shares in Massey right now. Um, <laughs> I think that literally remained open was a supermarket. But in terms of the future is really digital, so I would have to say, you know, um, you know, I think ranking is in a, in a pretty good position to, to benefit from this as well. So mobile app development, um, you know, talking about digital currencies, um, advising clients and helping, helping customers, helping businesses make that move to e-commerce to, to, to embrace the whole digital, the digital lifestyle. Um, so I think ranking you in a good position, you, you might want to... Yeah. 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 Digital Limited. You know, that's right. <laughs> All right. Um, Dexter, any I would, business? Yeah, I would add, I would add on that, Jamal. I would say maybe the community retail because with the with the border closure and the, the the people's inability to move freely, I think in the community that there, there might mm -hmm. be a some form of those business. One of the things we also have the ability to. Um, like we had initially discussed, to monetize the online events. I think IT professionals working with, our, with the industry um, can create those platforms because I think that's what's needed now. We don't necessarily have to wait on the Facebook and those, you know, obviously they have more um, R&D behind them, but I think we have the, the IT professionals who can work with us and create some of those platforms that we can now start monetizing our artists and, and who depend on social activities. So this is something Gideon yeah. asked, um, in, that's one of the questions. How can IT professional partner collaborate with and support with event planners and managers to create solutions for remote and hybrid events in the new paradigm? But you just mentioned that, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so let me go to bring another question, right? This right. is from Akim Larcher. This move to a digital economy is great, but the vast majority of the sector in St. Lucia is not established to allow for monetizing the services and products, right? What legislation is needed to make this all possible, right? So I could probably answer that question Right, a few years ago, I used to be on a committee that used to change the legislation every single year. So in order for it to be passed through cabinet, unfortunately at the time, I don't know if it has been done, but um, it, never, it never made it, you know, it was never approved. So um, that's the first thing that needs to be done. We need to actually see the benefits. We have to jot down the, the benefits, have it in a formal document and that needs to be passed by cabinet. So for example, at the time, I'm not too sure if it's like that now, somebody can um, correct me. Um, so Michelle, we don't have any internet laws or data protection laws, right? So therefore, if someone, let's say for you, Jamal, hacks into the cell system, takes down your website, you know, compromise your, your payment security, there isn't any legislation or any law in government that can protect you. They may probably, um, the lawyers may probably go through some archaic law um, referencing property theft, but there isn't any internet um, in any internet laws here. So that's an example why a lot of businesses in the U.S. would not trade online directly with Saint Lucia or the Caribbean, and it's because there are no laws protecting them. So that, that, therefore, companies like Ezo and Shopbox. Um, Aeropost, they are making the money because what they do is create a virtual environment in the United States within their jurisdiction 
in order for you to trade. So I think that answers that question. I don't know if anybody else has something to add on this, but um, that's the answer to that question. All right. Um, a question from Siobhan Lloyd, and that's for everybody, right? Um, Rissi, we could start with you. Um, how have your how has your business given yes. back in this time of uncertainty? You understand? Um, mm -hmm. so well, <coughs> since masks were um, the demand or is still in demand, we have made about a hundred or so. I personally have been driving around and giving it to vagrants um, as I see them along the street. Nice. There is a particular gentleman who sits by the zoo in mm. Union and he would usher the traffic, try to direct the traffic. So I remember stopping by and asking him if he had a mask, you know, and um, said, no, nobody wants to give me anything, you know, so I give him a few of them. But um, I don't always, everything is always not about money. So we don't just um, sell the mask, but we give <coughs> extras to those who might not be in a position to, um, to afford purchasing them. So yeah, that's okay. my contribution. Yeah. Next up. Yeah, so we have made a number of um, contributions towards the front line as well as a company. And I think up to last week, I think Lucas said was out there doing some different stuff for the for the front line. And I know there are other stuff in the making um, to, to support the front line. Um, like um, like we all know, I mean the money is part of it, the contribution is part of it. But um, the support to the to the to the economy and the the, the unknown or unspoken about economy and, and some of the support that is given on a daily basis um, is something that has been done, but without no major comment or may, no major fanfare. Okay, um, Lance. I mean, for us, what we what we've been doing well. From very early in the game, when we recognized um, the, the situation, we actually amended our, our refund policies and things of that nature to make sure that we can work with our clients and work with our, our customers um, in that way, in, as of the first instance. Um, and then we have a couple of other things that we're looking at, but what we're trying to do is at the end of, by the end of May, we should be rolling out some additional um, activities where we can seek to support um, you know, the persons within the, within the communities. Uh, on our end, we're, um, let me give uh, Venus Sherry a plug. Um, so Venus has started, um, I think he got, he got, he lives in the U.S., and mentioned living in the U.S., he got stuck here, um, <clears throat> couldn't fly back out because of the, the pandemic. Um, and he had started a GoFundMe, um, a GoFundMe to, to supply laptops to as many tablets, sorry, to as many students as possible. So we are working with him to provide those laptops at you know a ridiculous cost. Um, so that's one. And um, Dexter, well, both Dexter and I are actually from from the village of Labri, um, and we will be preparing a donation of of laptops of tablets, sorry, to the schools in 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 Labri. Right. Um, Dahlia? Um, unofficially, Tedison has been doing, he, he wanted to do some of his, his things without making a, a fuss about it. Um, he's been doing some deliveries with some um, food baskets, hampers, he's been doing that. But later on in the year, there's a project, we're just waiting for things to settle down. There's a project that we will be doing of which um, the proceeds will go to um, we're not sure what exactly it is yet, but obviously for the recovery for COVID-19. Um, I'm not sure everybody, if everybody's aware, but you're probably not aware, but um, as from an events perspective, I'm also the CEO of 238 Square Miles. Um, you would have seen the public service announcements, et cetera, that are being aired as it pertains to um, what we should be doing, the measures, the protocols. Um, in the beginning, when, when we realized that this thing was on us and um, St. Lucians were not taking it seriously or you still had some people thinking, you know, COVID was a nonsense and everybody was out in bars and all of that. 
there wasn't maybe apart from Ted Sandefur, there was not any official PSA or communication as it pertains to the protocols and the seriousness. Um, earlier on in at that time, we partnered with some of the artists, Tedison included, Arthur, etc., to come up with PSAs, etc., um, as it relates to spreading the, the the message. You know, being what it is you should and shouldn't be doing for COVID. Um, we all need to be responsible. If we're gonna come out of this thing alive, then that, that, that's important as well. Um, in the back end as well, we also a branding company. And so um, our CEO, Darwin God of that one has been working in the back end, some of the, the ministries and of health, et cetera, in putting some of their, their plans together. So we've been doing things in and out as it pertains to lending and giving back. All right, great guys. Right, um, we just have five minutes. I just extended to five minutes. A comment from Alana. We have to prepare for e-commerce much faster than we think. COVID has given us the opportunity to maximize and develop apps, e-commerce solutions, etc. We need to expand quickly as businesses. Mm -hmm, yeah. Right. Um, Melanie Pampel asks, is there a need to adjust current regulations to boost internet capacity? Capacity, sorry. <laughs> um, of, there is definitely a need to, but again, I just believe it's just a matter of time. Um, I think our governments and even the private sector understands the importance of internet right now. So mm -hmm. and recent, um, this morning I saw the Prime Minister um, sent out a post on, on social media advising people to um, more or less um, join the digital bandwagon, you know, learn courses, um, transition from your manual processing to digital, etc. So um, I don't know exactly when, if there's a timeline, but I think we are getting there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think there's also a drive from, from a CARICOM perspective also in ensuring that um, some of the rooming and some of, as a region that we are better equipped um, to use the, the, the technology also on the roaming charges also. So these things will play well in, in doing business across the region also, and not just locally. Okay, cool. Right, we have uh, um, a question from Otis Fs. Our economy is service oriented. The problem with lost service revenue is that it is less easy to catch up. Lost visits to restaurants, cinemas, and holiday bookings are not like a backlog of manufacturing. They are lost. That makes V-shaped recovery less likely. Coupled with the now more flawed frugality of customers, right? What is the panelist's view that management with the bandwidth to do so should also be thinking about initiatives other than cost cutting and bank covenants that would focus on actions that reward a customer and staff loyalty now, and uh, this will stimulate sales to new customers. Anybody would like to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a pretty long question. Yeah. Um, I think if I could give it a shot, <clears throat> I think, um, I mean, he's right in terms of revenue foregone. Um, I believe that, you know, we were fortunate to, to, to be able to open our doors and fall under the essential, uh, an essential service in terms of telecoms. Um, there are a lot of businesses that were not able to generate any sort of revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is just gone. Um, he meant he spoke about or he asked about you know stuff, um, customer loyalty, and asked about um, I think it was customer loyalty and, and staff um, recognition. I mean these are all part of the equation, and I, I think um, rightfully so that <clears throat> the spending power you know will be reduced. Um, you're going to have to try even harder now um, to, to, to be able to get a piece of that pie, that, that reduced or that smaller pie that the customer has now. Um, it's going to be even more competitive. When you are, as a business, 
<clears throat> we'll have to strengthen your value proposition and say, okay, how can I add additional value, you know, to what I am currently offering right now? So it's not just anymore about selling a phone, you know, it's about um, <clears throat> you have, you need to ensure the customer that, you know, number one, that they should come to you first because of you know, your warranties, you can deliver, that you can tech support in helping, in helping juries, you know, put all of those apps on, on those phones. Um, so I think it's, it, the customer loyalty program is something that we've, we've been talking about recently as well. It is going to be a dog fight. It's going to be more competitive I mean, in every industry because the, 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 the pocket has just shrunk. Um, so all of these things are in the equation and they need to be executed properly. Okay, great. Um, I have a, a message um, that's towards Dexter, that's from Jamal Cyril. How would you use the recent trend of events via social media to market your brands? And do you believe that sponsoring virtual events is beneficial to your brand with the knowledge that it will drive direct sales at this time to your company? Well, if you think of direct sales at this time, there's, there's no sales. So <laughs> well, at this time, the way I see it, the matter of remaining relevant and not be forgotten. I think when there is some form of, of, of normality and i say full of normality with some caution in the sense that you will then be able to to purchase um some form of of, of a beverage or alcohol um the market is moving towards that trend so as a brand you need to you need to be relevant um so yeah that's that's where you have to be um in the advent of, of event planning and all the expenditure that would have come with production and setup have seen most of that be, 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 be a gone deal. Um, now products of the placement becomes a bigger um, aspect to the sponsorship equation. And if I may jump back to, to, to the point on by, by Otis, I think knowing your, knowing your customers, knowing your customers is very, very important. I don't think I can, I can express the point Good enough because in a world where we bombarded with, with with information coming from all ends, I mean, gone are the days when you when you were in the bus, you <clears throat> listen to the radio or listen to a CD. Now you have total control of what you listen to, who you speak to, when, so you can be present mm -hmm. and be miles away in a conference or be miles away talking to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So with the bombardment of information coming to me as a as a consumer, to, to all these consumers out there, it is very important that you know your customers. How do you know your customers? It's back to IT again, because if you can track the information of who's buying my, I speak to Otis directly, who's buying my, my, my Tuesday package or my Tuesday special, then now I can know how to reach out to you through either a survey or through capturing your information and then put you on a rewards program. So for your loyal customers, there can be, you can have what, what a reward and retention program based on your purchase. I think the, 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 um, the pizza industry, they do that very well in capturing in capturing the coupons and then they, 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 they plug it for you. Every time you order a pizza, you get a free pizza. So I think there are different things that can be done. The revenue is gone, it's gone, but at the end of the day, consumers will still have needs. And, and, and if, you, if I think directly of, of, of a brand like KFC and, and KFC being like somewhat of a household brand name for St. Lucia, I think the touch point has already been created <clears throat> out of find new ways and out of the box ways of, 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 of doing business. Um, Jamal's point to office space and, and offering the service. So it can be when you go to KFC now, you know, you can get your something else. You can get a combined product coming from a one a drive through at KFC. So one drive through could be you pick up your KFC and your, your food. The next one could be you pick up your delivery service from your grocery. So again, is how, how we innovate and how we get out of the box and think of the new way of doing business. I thought KFC was an essential service. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think it is. I think it is. Right? <laughs> Guys, this has, we have come to the end of this beautiful discussion. Right? Thank you all for participating. Right? And for taking the time off out today for sharing your knowledge, experience, and how you adapted to the new normal. Thank you also to the attendees for registering and joining this webinar. I hope this webinar has been informative and inspiring, and I wish you all the best over the next um, few months. You know, so 
Um, this is going to be a series of webinars. This is the first one. I was a little bit nervous, <laughs> I must admit, right? Because I've never conducted a webinar before. And um, again, it is just one to three days so slash um, Dazzle Magazine's way of evolving and even adapting and creating content. So once again, guys, thank you for participating. And I hope to see you in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thanks Rankin. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. Okay. All right. Good job. Stay safe. All right. I will. I will do. <laughs>